about four or five days before I have a half a mouth of teeth pulled for a partial, I chip my front tooth. So I really look like a hillbilly, and I can't any do anything about it for right now. But anyway, you have to get used to that for a while, it seems. I've got to get used to that for a while. Things for which we have no choice. There are things that we really have no choice. You know, we look at it from a, a practical standpoint. We can't change gravity. We have no choice but accepting gravity the way it is. You can jump up and down all you want to, but you're not going to change gravity. You can climb up a tree. You fall out, you're going to fall down. You won't fall up. Ice is going to be cold. Fire is going to be hot. Not going to change. That's the way it is. Well, there are some other things that we're going to look at tonight that we can't change. Now, first of all, I want to back up the whole way to Genesis, first chapter, verse 26. This is kind of a strange segue into this, but uh, bear with me. In Genesis 1, verse 26, the Bible says, Let us make man in our image. So from the dust of the ground, he made man. From man's DNA, he created woman. Now, when he created man, he created man as a free moral agent, not a robot. I mean, God could have programmed us to do whatever he bids, whatever he wanted us to do. But he created us to be free moral agents. Though it is unstated in this passage, God has total authority in that he is the creator of the created. We are the created. He's the creator. Being the creator, then we have established his authority. And of course, as we go through the Bible, it is stated often that God has the authority over man. And God can do what God wants to do. It's his authority. There's things that we choose. In Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, God said, I call heaven and earth as witness today against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. Choose life. Now, one of the things that we're going to notice is that our choices have consequences. And we'll look at that in a little bit later. Joshua 24, verse 15. Joshua told Israel, If it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, you choose for yourselves. You choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. My choice, according to Joshua, was to serve God. Me and my family, and by the way, dads, husbands, he made that choice for his family. Sometimes it's the wife making the choice for the family. It should be the husband. He is the religious leader of the family and the head. Just thought I'd throw that in there. Now, Matthew 7, verse 13, Jesus said there's two gates. You enter in by the narrow gate. But most people go in the wide gate. Jesus is saying we've got a choice to make. The narrow gate leads to eternal life. The wide gate 
to eternal death. It's your choice. In these things we have a choice. But there are some things by which we can, we have no choice. Now, the first thing I'm going to look at is we cannot choose what to do to be saved. It's not a matter of personal preference. Well, you know, I don't like water, so I don't want to be baptized. Well, you know, I heard a preacher say one time that we're saved by faith alone. Well, you know, my folks believed that we're saved, once saved, always saved. You see, we cannot choose a different plan of salvation. God has the ultimate authority and the terms of salvation has been determined by God. And no matter how I feel about it or what I think about it, it doesn't matter. The choice is to follow God's Word. In John 5, 24, Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. And shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death unto life. He who hears my word. The plan of salvation is nestled within the words of Christ. They were basically dictated to Christ by the Father. He orchestrated it. Jesus brought it out and taught it. The Holy Spirit would reveal it through the words of the apostles. We have no right to try to adapt it to our own desires, our own wills. But rather, we must choose to follow it. Which really isn't a choice at all, because if we're going to be saved, according to Jesus, it's got to be through His Word. It's determined by God, verse 40. In verse 40. Now, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. By the way, I read the wrong verse a while ago. Should have been verse 34. Yet I do not receive testimony from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. Well, either one of them works. Now, the Father revealed to us through the Son to listen to Him. Matthew 17, 1. I want you to pay some attention. We read this a lot and we uh, refer to it. This is the Mount of Transfiguration and the events that, that transpired there on that mount. I want you to pay attention to what happened. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. You see this transfiguration, this transformation of Jesus on that mount. It is as if he took the form of these two prophets that he would discuss his mission with. Behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said, you know, can you imagine what these apostles felt? Now, one of the interesting things to me is how did they know who Peter, or excuse me, how, who Moses and Elijah was? How did they know that? They'd never seen them. They'd read about them. But yet they recognized them. Well, we're not told how they recognized them. But I just think that's interesting. Recognizing Moses and Elijah with Christ, Peter said, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Can you imagine the excitement they felt being in the presence of the greats? Let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Let us build three memorials, three altars, three places of honor, one for you, Lord, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. A place where we'll see for centuries where 
you met with these two greats. While he was yet speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. You listen to him. Now all of these people today, preachers and whoever, who say we're to still listen to Moses, God says no. You know, God at sundry times spake of the fathers through the prophets, including Moses, but has in his last days spoken to us through his dear son. Hebrews 1 and 1 and 2. No longer do we hear Moses or the prophets. Jesus came to fulfill, Luke 24 tells us, the law and the prophets. And they have been fulfilled. So, The authority of God has now been received through Jesus Christ and it's His authority by which we will be saved or lost. He is a spokesman for God. As we read in Matthew 17, 1. I could choose to believe in faith only. I mean, that's my choice. But if I do, it violates the authority of Jesus Christ. I can believe in once saved, always saved. But if I do, it violates the authority of Christ. So if I want to please Christ, the Father, God, then I have got to follow Him, and there's no choice in going astray from the truth He's revealed. I must honor his authority. I can't pick and choose what I want to do to be saved. I am amazed. I, and I've said this and said this, and I know this is the wrong group, but I'm just amazed that people think that they'll get away from altering God's plan of salvation. That they can change it to something more pleasing to themselves. It doesn't work that way. We do not attend the church of our choice. I remember in the Sunday paper years ago at Dallas, still may do it, I don't know, but they used to have a list of all the Dallas churches and it said up at the top, attend the church of your choice. You know, now there's about 3,000 churches. That's a choice to be made, isn't it? We are to attend the church that Christ built. Matthew 16, verse 16. I will build my church. If you will notice in the context, the word church is singular, not plural. Not churches. I'm not going to build my churches. I will build my church. Universal. Now, there are local congregations, but they're all under the roof of the same church. The universal church that Jesus Christ has built. The one for which Christ is head. Ephesians 1 and verse 22. He is the head of the body, which is the church. There is one body, Ephesians 4 and verse 4. You know, some people must think Christ must be a freak. Because if you read the Bible and you notice Jesus is the head of the church, if there are over 3,000 legitimate churches then you've got one head and 3,000 beliefs, 3,000 churches. Come on, give me a break. And it says there is one body. How can we miss that? In Ephesians 4 verse 4. 
and he is the head of that body. In Ephesians 1, verse 23, talks about the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all and all. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, singular. Not the churches, the church, singular. Let me ask you a question. You've got a group of people over here that's following the Bible. That's obeying His authority. On the other side of the spectrum, you have a group that has altered and changed what Christ has dedicated. Which one do you think God's going to be pleased with? The one who's made the changes to suit their own personality or their own uh, preference or the group that follows the pattern of the New Testament? It's a simple question and a question that everyone needs to answer. It's not a matter of personal choice. It's a matter of following what Christ has set by through his authority. We cannot choose how we worship. I understand I'm preaching to the crowd, to the choir, but tonight is a reminder of things that we need to be aware of and we need to share. I want us to think about something. In all of these churches that we have around us, all of these churches have similar forms of worship, but at the same time they're different. As we've talked about before, the church has become more of an entertainment program than a God-fearing, God-pleasing program. I've heard some stories that's hard for me to believe, but I believe them. One of the ones, and I'm going to call this one by name because it just shocks me. The rodeo church or the cowboy church. The cowboys have their own church now. Who's the head of the cowboy church? Gene Autry. John Wayne. I can tell you it's not Jesus Christ. Because he only has one head, one body. And that's the body that follows his will. I hate to pick on these different beliefs, but folks, their souls is reliant on doing God's will. And by transgressing, they're going beyond God's will and they're going to lose their souls. Just like I would lose my soul. It's not left up to us to choose our worship. Cain, in the book of Genesis, chose the wrong sacrifice to please God. And then got mad at God and took it out on his brother Abel. Because God did not accept his sacrifice. So he killed his brother Abel. Noah, on the other hand, followed God's will. And built the ark to his God's specifications. He didn't change anything. He used the wood. He had the number of doors and windows that God specified. The length, the breadth, the height. All by God's design. Now again, it was not 
prepared for speed. It was prepared for agility and strength and to drift. That's it. That was the way it was built. That's why it was probably blocked off. Looked like a floating brick, probably. But at any rate, it was by God's specifications. Talking about the ark, what about the ark of the covenant? What if Moses said, I don't want to, to overlay this thing with gold? And I don't want to put but one cherubim on it. When God specified all of these things, would he have been obedience to God? Well, see, I don't want to be immersed in baptism. I want to be sprinkled. Well, what does the Bible say? It says to be baptized. Now, you said, yeah, but there's so many different types of baptism. No, there's not. There's only one baptism. Again, going back to Ephesians 4. And that baptism is inherent in the name baptism. Baptizo. To dip, to plunge, to immerse. That's what that word always means. Without any kind of uh, distinction with other, like Webster, he put sprinkling in there. It never means that. That's a different word altogether. It's the word rentenzo, which means to sprinkle. And that is never used with reference to salvation of man. Always baptism. Now, just not just any baptism. It's a baptism for the remission of sins. Acts 2 verse 38. The baptism for the answer to God with a good conscience. 1 Peter 3 21. For salvation. 1 Peter 3 21. That's the baptism that's going to save us. We don't have the right to pick and choose or to change or to alter. You know, for years, for years, there was a certain pattern that the church followed. Now, it did go off on certain areas like the eldership and the power of the elders and the way that they began to uh, set up a, a mono bishopric or one elder overseeing different congregations and this congregation overseeing several others, that kind of thing. Yeah, they did fall apart on that. But on baptism, it was several centuries before they uh, quit stressing the importance of baptism. And it was during the days of Constantine when they changed baptism for sprinkling. And that was a king's edict. Like instrumental music, for 1,200 years they didn't use it. Then in the 1,200s, the Catholic Church brought it in. Why can't we see that? Why can't we just go back to the way God originally designed his church and his worship? Nadab and Abihu chose to offer strange fire, and we know that didn't end well for them. We can't choose when the Lord will return. Lord, I know, wait a minute, it's, it's Sunday. Uh, no, Lord, I, this is not a good time for you to come. I'm really not quite ready. Well, it doesn't matter if we're ready or not. When the Lord comes, he's going to come. So it would behoove us to get ready. Peter tells us it's going to be like a thief in the night. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. We don't know when the thief will come. We have to be prepared for him when he does come. But he's not going to call and make an appointment. 
to come rob us. Matthew 24 and verse 36. Unlike the destruction of Jerusalem that he talks about in the first part of chapter 24. He said, you're going to know when that happens. And you need to flee out of Jerusalem. But when the Lord returns, you're not going to know. No man knows. Not even the angels in heaven knows when he's going to return. So we have no choice when he does return. We have no say in that. But we do know this. He will come suddenly. Suddenly. You know, if I could snap my fingers, I can't. For some reason, I don't know how. <laughs> my daddy never taught me that. But if I could snap my fingers, I'd do it right now. In the length of time it would take you to snap your finger, the Lord could have already come and collected his own and condemned the lost. That's why John would say, even so, Lord, come quickly. I know he's talking about how soon, but he can come quick. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. All in the twinkle of an eye. In the snap of a finger. Once that happens, there will be no chance to prepare to get ready. We'll have no other choice but to respond to that coming. The time of preparation is over. Lastly, our choices have consequences. When we make choices, especially bad choices, then the consequences will not be good. If our choices are based on selfish motives or rebellion against God, it ends up with dire consequences. Choices based on God's authority, we please Him. Tonight, what do you choose? Maybe I should ask, who do you choose? He will come in a moment in the, in the twinkling of an eye. And, I, and when he returns, there'll be some people surprised. Sadly. And this should cause us much grief and pain. Because sadly, when he returns, there's going to be some surprises. Some people are going to think they're prepared but they're not. Some people think that they will have gotten themselves ready, but they won't because they did it their way, not God's way. So tonight, we have no choice if we want to please God but to follow his word and his way. His way, of course, is through our response to the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Through our faith, through our confession, through our repentance, and in our baptism. And if you've done all of that, God bless you. And if you're living faithful, God bless you. Hang in there. Keep strong. Don't give up. 
But if you have fallen away, you need to return. You need to return. Get back on track. Get back where God wants you to be. I said before you this evening, life and death. Choose life as we stand and sing together.